everyone. So um, we're going to uh, go ahead and start the speakers now. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Paul Schmidt-Hempel from ETH Zurich. And he's going to be talking about diversity in multiple infections. Okay. Okay, I see that I have to keep to my time, so this one also right. <laughs> and uh, the talk is going to be about diversity and multiple inspections. Actually, I'm going to not focus so much on costs. I mean, it'll be something about costs. But I thought I'd do a step further. And uh, I have three parts. The first part, I will discuss the diversity of what actually the immune system is challenged with. And I'll do all of that with one example, which is the example we studying for quite a while, which is a trypanosome infection in our uh, pet species, the bumblebees, bumblebees uh, species. And in the second part, I'm going to refer a little bit more about the immune defenses that are involved in that kind of infections. So let's start by looking at, oh, sorry, let's do it again. Uh, well, of course, that's not all my work. I'm mainly shifting around papers and trying to get money. But the real work is done by people like uh, these here on the list. And in particular, in this case, it's Yuko, Hauke, uh, Uri, Ryan, Martina, Taniazzo that have added a lot to what I'm going to say. So the system I'm going to talk about is Critidia bombi, which is a trypanosome. Here is where it belongs to in its phylogeny. It is uh, distantly related to the famous African trypanosomes, Brucei, and uh, crudes and all these kind of things. It is more closely related to leptomonas and phytomonas actually, so it's not unlikely that this bug initially entered the pollinator actually via the plant. So that makes a lot of sense. If you're a pollinator, they probably also sometimes pick up infections that have been uh, infections on plants. So today we know it belongs here, and actually as you can see here, it's A and B. In fact, there are now two, actually now three species. It has a worldwide distribution. Uh, you, you can see here a phylogeographic tree based on cytochrome B. For example, type A1 is worldwide in its distribution from North, uh, North America to Central Asia. Uh, the center of origin, of course, for the host species is uh, Western China. Uh, that's also where you find quite a bit of diversity, and it is spread. Uh, other types, of course, have not the same distribution. For example, B2, A2 seems to be restricted to North America mostly, and so on. And you can see here is the second species. So the message here is poorly, yes, this uh, uh, trypanosome comes in many forms, and it actually occurs worldwide in all, almost all host species that we've checked so far. This is one of the host species, which is our pet species. It's uh, the common European bumblebee bombs terrestris. It is uh, quite a bit uh, of economic value. It is bred and shipped around in the world in large numbers. I presume we also taking the parasites with them, something we're at the moment investigating. Uh, it has a simple life cycle in, in that the queens, which are the females, essentially come out in spring found the colonies, the colonies grow in numbers, so it's a social insect, obviously, and finally it collapses. So early, well, mid-July this year, it's very early, very early actually, uh, the colony reproduces. And the interesting bit for the parasite, of course, is that it can only get to the next year by entering one of the dog creeds that then over winter will come out next spring. <coughs> this is how the colony looks like in full swing, and it doesn't need much fantasy to say, well, this is a heaven for a parasite, because you can jump easily from one host to the next once you have made it into this column. Now the life cycle of the uh, parasite itself is also quite simple. It's monoxenous, so it has just one host. Of course, many host species. It is directly transmitted, which is different from uh, most trypanosomes that are studied otherwise, which are vectored by mosquitoes, for example. And it is shed in the feces and is taken up by eating her os, and it can happen in the colony and as we also know, it can happen as it is spread through the flowers or via the flowers. So when an infected worker visits a flower, he deposits some cells, and then the next one to come along picks it up and gets infected. What is the effect? Actually, that's something which is sometimes not so easy to find out. So after a number of years, we've suddenly uh, figured out that actually when it takes effect, is just once, or basically once in the, in the life cycle of the host. And this is when the spring queens, otherwise that have overwintered, 
come out, start their own family, their own colony. When they start their colony, it takes effect. And if you are infected, your chances to get a colony and grow and have fitness afterwards by reproducing is going to be diminished by something like about 40%. Uh, Depends a little bit how long these uh, hosts have hibernated. In fact, it's more, the natural situation is more like that, it's more like seven or eight months actually in, in reality. So in, as you can see, there's a huge difference whether or not you're infected. And this is the moment in the life cycle of the host where it takes effect. Now, if one thinks about what the immune system has to cope with, of course, it's also important to know what the effect of a particular parasite might be and when the host defense should actually act or not. Now, we figured out <coughs> that what we have here, and again, I'm telling you that to say, well, first, before we can talk about the immune system and the immunology, we also have to have an idea what actually challenges the immune system, what is the natural situation. And this is, in some sense, also a plea that we should not forget about the natural history behind all this research we're doing. So what's happening here is clearly something like a seasonal epidemics, which is something you can uh, observe in many systems, I guess, where the parasite is carried over through the winter. In spring, it infects a particular family or colony. The colony grows, and at the end of the season, they disperse, or the sexuals disperse, go into hibernation, and they carry an infection. But it's not only that they go into hibernation locally, but they also disperse. Actually, in this particular case, it's quite distant, so it can be up to 100 or maybe 200 kilometers, we figured out in the meantime. You also get the concurrent epidemics, of course, of another female that does the same, and by and large, the third one, and they start to exchange the infections as they commonly share the flowers and take out the resources they need. So this is the picture we have about this parasite and how they actually uh, goes about in the, in the environment. Now, having illustrated that with one particular species, one shouldn't forget this is an entire host community. And this parasite, like many others, is going to infect a lot of species at the same time. Here there, uh, is an illustration of a typical host community as you would find it in Central Europe. There are typically something like four to six here common species, and there are about the same number of rare species of hosts. In all of them, you can find these parasites at different frequencies, obviously, and prevalences, and uh, they share somehow their, uh, their lifestyle. Now, I'm not going to explain in detail all these graphs. What it means is that we have checked, for example, what determines the distribution of these parasites in, in field populations, and we've done this by genetic markers, and I'll come to that in a second. And it turns out that the best predictor to, for what kind of uh, parasite genotype you'll find in a particular individual is actually the flower species they are visiting, which points to the fact that the transmission uh, engine is essentially a flower visit, so that's shared, that's where it's shared among uh, species in the same habitat. And it's to some degree the host species, which of course also determines the flower species because these animals uh, slightly differentiate according to the ecological niche and so share the parasites as they go along. Now, these graphs are actually redundancy analysis plots and have two axes, and the genetic diversity of these strains is sort of uh, 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 taken out and actually uh, uh, analyzed according to these components. So, so I'm not going into this technique, uh, standard technique in more detail, just saying, yes, the data tell us these parasites are spread among hosts in the same community, and it's mostly done by the shared use of resources. Now let me <coughs> come in part 1b, so to speak, to the genetics of this parasite because this is our tool to understand what kind of diversity of infections we have. It turns out that the parasite has a typically sized uh, genome, it's about 35 megabases, and we have uh, sequences now uh, completely. We have used so far mainly five polymorphic microsatellite markers, which you are seeing here. It's a diplase species, and you see it here labeled uh, the number of police, uh, examples of alleles that, for example, belong to this locus. And the reason I'm showing you this is that you can, of course, add up these alleles and combine it. And for example, what you see here would add up into something like 20,000 genotypes that are possible. Now, the question, obviously, is do we see this diversity in field? And this is something that, in the end, the immune system of the host has to cope with. And the short answer is yes, nearly so. What we do see is an amazing diversity. It is something that characterizes the systems in a big way that if you go out and pick up an individual host and type its infections, 
it's hard to find another one of the same genotype. So you pick up the next individual and the genotype is completely different. So this is shown here. This is a C over N plot. And actually what it says is that as you add more and more infections in your sample, so infected individuals, and you count the number of different genotypes you have in the sample, it pretty fast converges to the line of one, which means every new individual, so to speak, that you take up has a new infection that you uh, can type. So the diversity is truly enormous. And of course, we have asked ourselves, what is actually the underlying reason to find this diversity? Actually, it's another example here. These are uh, eight colonies symbolized with their infections by genotypes. So every color number is a different genotype. And if you go through this uh, graph here, you can see that actually not a single genotype occurs twice. And some of the families have one infection, and some have several infections. So I come to that also in a second. In fact, it's here shown in the table, and particularly the column here, different court, different localities in uh, Central Europe, meaning of course Switzerland in this particular case. So these are more or less the lowlands or mountainous areas here in the Alps. And as you go through the table, you can see that the frequency of multiple infections, so one host harboring more than one strain of this parasite, is actually quite high. So on average, we estimate that about 40 to 50 percent, roughly one half, let's say of all the infections that you have in a natural situation is a multiple infection. <clears throat> now, the multiple infection has several consequences. And one consequence is quite important as the engine of diversity. We have asked ourselves whether this parasite is colonial or sexual. As you can see, I'm starting from the parasite side here in the first part. And this is an old discussion in the triprenosome world, actually in the protozoan world in general. As you can see here on the graph, we sometimes find cells that seem to fuse or to split apart, as shown here. So this is the parasite here. <clears throat> and luckily enough, we have developed a technique by which we can take out the parasite from the host, clone them in media, uh, grow them up, and type them genetically. So this is uh, shown here. In this particular case, in an experimental infection, you infect with two different lines, strains of the parasite, yellow and red, and you take out from the Feces, so this is a gut parasite, I should mention that, I should mention that. It's taken up by us, it is in the gut, it resides in the high cup, it actually grows here, and then it's shed in the feces by cells. So you can take them out, type them, and look at the genotype, but what turns out to be the case is, yes, indeed, these parasites do genetic exchange as they get together. And, for example, uh, referring to 91 co-infections that are staged, for example, in 70% of the cases, you get a exchange of genetic material. In some cases, uh, this exchange is recombinant. So this is a normal Mendelian combinant, recombinant in terms of what the consequences are, which comes in many, dif many different variants, many different recombinant types, but each represented actually by very few clones. Whereas in some cases, 7% of the cases, you get loss of alleles, new alleles, so mutations really, and you get a completely new variant, and this variant seems to be quite successful because it comes up in many different clones, many different replicates, so to speak. So this is uh, referring to the number of co-infections, this is referring to the number of typed clones. So as you can see, this is quite a sensible sample size, so we're very confident that one of the engines actually that generates this diversity is actually the exchange of genes as these animals, or these uh, protozoans, infect, co-infect the uh, This is how the null types look like, the distribution of changes in the allele size, and the graph says nothing else than it seems to be a case where there could be some slippage during the recombination uh, process, 